So I'm going to talk about immunosuppression and cardiac transplantation and start in the very beginning and then tell where we've evolved and where I think we should be going. So first heart transplant was done in Cape Town 50 years ago. Um, there have been 140,000 transplants since then. However, back then there was, there was very little understanding of the immune response to a transplanted organ. So the immunosuppression that was used was very primitive. The first patient who was transplanted lived only 18 days after transplant and was treated with high-dose steroids because the physicians thought that he had rejection, whereas he ended up he had pneumonia and died of pneumonia, and the immunosuppression didn't help him. Uh, it was the introduction of cyclosporin in the early 1980s, which was the first relatively specific immunosuppressive agent that improved uh, outcomes, that made people survive rejections, reduced the severity of infections. That resulted in the dramatic increase subsequently in number of transplants done around the world. Um, and current trends, at least in the United States, in transplant candidate, candidacy is that patients are older. They generally are sicker at the time of transplant. They are often supported with short-term mechanical support. There are more women. And as I mentioned, there are more patients on mechanical circulatory support. So these patients going into transplant now are sicker. Um, you've heard about the major... Um, post-transplant complications in the early post-transplant period. Rejection and infection are the most common problems. Later on, cardiac allograft vasculopathy, the transplant coronary disease, becomes the major cause of death. Malignancy is number two. And then as a result of the immunosuppressive agents that we use, hypertension and nephrotoxicity are also major complications. Um, the good news is that survival since the very early days of transplant, since the introduction of cyclosporin, has improved. But most of that improvement in survival has been in the first six months because we see, as a previous speaker mentioned, we see less rejection. People aren't dying of rejection. And also, we're better able to prophylax against infections. But if you look at beyond the first year post-transplant, uh, the slopes of these curves are identical, which means that there are things that are killing patients that we really have not had much of an impact on. And those things are allograft vas uh, cardiac allograft vasculopathy and malignancy. Um, Nonspecific graft failure is usually due to cardiac allograft vasculopathy. And here we see this again. So the major causes of death beyond the first year post-transplant, the major limitations to long-term survival are the transplant coronary disease and malignancy. So immunosuppressive agents, the cornerstone are the calcineurin inhibitors like cyclosporin and tacrolimus. They inhibit T cell proliferation and activation by inhibiting calcineurin and then the production of interleukin-2, which causes T cell proliferation and, um, and activation. Uh, then antiproliferatives, mycophenolate, azathioprine was the traditional one used. These pre pre prevent the proliferation of T cells. And corticosteroids are used. They have a wide variety of effects in terms of inhibiting cytokines, lymphocyte circulation, and the function of antigen-presenting cells. Um, a very busy slide, but this points all of, uh, the mechanisms of all of the various immunosuppressive agents we use. So cyclosporin and tacrolimus, uh, azathioprine, MMF, and sirolimus, everolimus, and steroids all over the place. And if you want to get a good under understanding of transplant immunology, this paper by Phil Halloran from Canada in the New England Journal of Medicine 15 years ago is still the best review article. So this shows also where the immunosuppressive agents work. Calcineurin, which results in IL-2 production, is blocked by cyclosporin and tactocrolimus. Sirolimus and, ever and everolimus block the target of rapamycin which is involved in cell proliferation. And MMF and azathioprine are involved in purine synthesis and hence production of uh, DNA and cell proliferation. Now, why do we use, in the US now and around the world, most places use tacrolimus instead of cyclosporin. And tacrolimus has largely replaced cyclosporin. This is a clinical trial that we did uh, 
Uh, it was published 14, uh, 13 years ago, but we did about 15 years ago, a randomized trial of tacrolimus and cyclosporin versus tacrolimus and MMF versus cyclosporin and MMF. And what we found was that the likelihood of rejection was lowest in the tacrolimus and MMF arm. So the results of this test, of this study, led to the complete replacement over the next 10 years of cyclosporin with tacrolimus. Another group of drugs that have, may, have, be, have had a significant impact on transplantation are the um, mechanistic, mechanistic target of rapamycin inhibitors. Uh, they inhibit T cell proliferation as well as the proliferation of other cells such as vascular smooth muscle cells, uh, which pro proliferate in response to endothelial injury. And this is where they work over here on mTOR. And so they block proliferation of a variety of cells. And these drugs, in fact, are used in drug-eluting stents, as everybody knows, to limit the um, vascular smooth muscle cell hyperplasia in response to, to uh, stent deployment. Um, cellular rejection is marshaled by CD4 8 and CD, CD4 positive and CD8 positive cells. Seen this already. We've seen these rejection slides. Here's rejection. The um, good news is that we see much less rejection than we used to see. If you look at the ISHLT, International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant Registry, only about 10% of patients worldwide have rejections. Patients who have um, no rejections have better outcomes than patients who have, uh, have had uh, treated rejections. And this shows the freedom of rejection over time. We're seeing less rejections because we use more potent immunosuppressive agents, tacrolimus instead of cyclosporin, MMF instead of azathioprine. Our long-term challenges remain the consequences of the drugs we use, like renal failure and, and metabolic adverse events from tacrolimus and corticosteroids, cardiac allograft vasculopathy, and malignancy. And this shows, again, the, the causes of morbidity uh, renal dysfunction is a significant problem in these patients long term, as is hypertension. Hypertension is a result of the calcineurin inhibitors. And a very important paper about 16 years ago showed that the frequency of renal dysfunction in heart patients, heart transplant patients, was relatively high. And as a result, this led to efforts to reduce the target trough levels of tacrolimus that we use to maintain creatinines under two. Because we know at one year, if patients have a creatinine above two, their outcomes, long-term survivals, are diminished. So I make efforts to make sure that the chromus levels are reduced so that creatinines are less than two. And as a result of that, we're seeing less renal dysfunction than we used to see. The other issue is malignancy. Um, the major malignancies are post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder Many of these patients, this is due to Epstein-Barr virus. The other major malignancy is squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. Um, many of our patients are fair-skinned, and they grew up in an era when you, when, you, when you didn't put sunscreen on, and then they get immunosuppression, so they develop uh, um, squamous cell carcinoma. And we've dealt with this by developing a transplant dermatology clinic, which every three months sees these patients and removes incipient squamous cell carcinomas. Um, the adenocarcinomas are not, are, that we think about, like prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, are not more common in these patients. But when these patients develop these cancers, they're much more aggressive and often widely metastatic. So we will do screening, uh, GYN, GYN screening, colonoscopy, uh, mam mammography to make sure that uh, patients don't have these these malignancies going into transplant. Um, as a result of these efforts, we are seeing greater freedom from malignancy now than 20 years ago. But there are areas of uncertainty. For example, the relationship between different immunosuppressive agents and cancer risk, the duration and intensity of immunosuppression and cancer risk. We think the more immunosuppression we use, the longer we use it, the worse it is. Efficacy of low or minimal immunosuppressive regimens. Are these better at preventing rejection? Frequency of cancer screening, and what should the components of cancer screening be? 
So one thing that we've started doing in people who are smokers or have a history of smoking is to do CT scans of their chest prior to listing them for transplant to see if they have any evidence of potential lung cancer. Um, another strategy for um, in the early post-transplant period is induction therapy. Some people believe that these are very useful at preventing rejection. Um, there are a number of different types, polyclonal antibodies, anti-IL-2 receptor antibodies. We usually use these, um, and we use them in people who have elevated creatinines going into transplant, so we can de delay by about a week the initiation of calcineurin inhibitors, because calcineurin inhibitors are nephrotoxic. And this shows uh, maintenance immunosuppression, so tacrolimus, the major calcineurin inhibitor compared to cyclosporin. And uh, MMF has largely displaced azathioprine. Um, Sirolimus and everolimus are used in low numbers. And this I find surprising. Patients are still, a lot of patients are still on corticosteroids. We aim to get our patients off corticosteroids by six months post-transplant. I'd say 95% of our patients are off corticosteroids. Um, skip that. This is cardiac allograft vasculopathy. So this is the major cause of death in patients post-transplant, uh, one year post-transplant. This was one of our patients who was a year post-transplant, came in with heart failure, had gotten a heart from an 18-year-old. Um, the angiogram immediately after the transplant was normal. Then he developed a cardiac arrest in the hospital, and this is his LAD. This is the lumen, and you see T cells and smooth muscle cells everywhere. So the pathogenesis, it's multifactorial. Um, it's damage to the donor endothelium diffusely and then smooth muscle cell proliferation. And there's upregulation of inflammatory uh, mediators and cytokines. It affects probably closer to 50% of patients at five years in some way. It can be a diffuse disease. It may be associated with cytomegalovirus has a loose relationship to atherosclerotic risk factors, and histology resembles restenosis after angioplasty, except it's much more diffuse. A survival of three years after diagnosis is made 60 to 80 percent. If there's three-vessel disease, there's a much lower survival, and death is usually due to sudden cardiac death or MI or heart failure. These patients usually have silent ischemic uh, events because their hearts are denervated. Uh, the good news is that there's, we have greater freedom from cardiac allograft vasculopathy, and a lot of this may be related to the fact that we use statins routinely in these patients, which are anti-inflammatory and have reduced the incidence of cardiac allograft vasculopathy. Once a patient has CAV, however, their survival is worse than patients who don't have CAV. And this is the disease you see in two years. There's near obliteration of not just distal vessels, but proximal vessels. These are all the things that cause endothelial in injury and result in intimal hyperplasia, which is cardiac allograft vasculopathy. We see here. Inflammation, these are all the mediators. And we use intravascular ultrasound as a surrogate marker for identifying patients who are at risk, risk of adverse events. And this is very helpful for clinical trials. So this is the IVIS catheter. And this is intimal hyperplasia. This is the lumen. So this is a patient with cardiac allograft vasculopathy. Angiography is a um, often misses cardiac allograft vasculopathy. This is one of our patients who, from, from many years ago, who died of cardiac allograft vasculopathy and on post had this large um, ectopic uh, plaque, which was missed angiographically. IVIS can pick these things up. So here you see what looks like normal angiography, but a large area of plaque, and this is relatively normal over here. And there are important measurements that we get from IVIS that are predictive. So perhaps the most important one is change in maximal intimal thickness from the baseline angiogram to one year later. A number of centers have looked at that. Mara from Oxner showed that a change in maximal intimal thickness of 0.5 millimeters from baseline to one year resulted in increased risk of death MI retransplantation four years later. Stanford, greater risk four years, reduction in cardiac survival, and the Cleveland Clinic, 
same findings. Five years later, increased death, MI, heart failure, 43 months later. Uh, a multi-center study by Kabashigawa looked at patients with, with um, baseline and one-year IVUSes and found that those that had a change, oops, oops, greater than 0.5 millimeters from baseline to one year had a higher incidence of death, more non-fatal ma major adverse cardiac events, and more newly occurring angiographic luminal irregularities. So the greater the change in maximal int uh, intimal thickness from baseline to one year, the greater the risk of cardiac events four or five years later. One of the biggest changes and that, that resulted in reduction in the incidence of cardiac allograft vasculopathy was the, the statin studies. This is from UCLA, randomized study of, of pravastatin versus control, better survival, less cardiac allograft vasculopathy, less CAV on IVUS, and less rejection mortality. This was repeated by a German group using simvastatin, similar observations. So patients routinely get the statins, which are anti-inflammatory, and their benefit in terms of reducing the risk of unstable plaques in non-transplant patients are also due to their anti-inflammatory effects. MMF replaced azathioprine as a result of a multi-center study, randomized study of MMF versus azathioprine, which showed less mortality in MMF, less treated rejection, um, and less rejection with hemodynamic compromise. There was no evidence in this study that there was an effect on cardiac allograft vasculopathy by quantitative angiography or IVUS. So let's talk about the mTOR inhibitors. Uh, I've shown the slide that they affect proliferation by inhibiting mTOR. Uh, one of the early studies was Sirolimus study from Australia and New Zealand, where patients were randomized to one of two doses of Sirolimus or azathioprine, and uh, the, the rejection rate and, chain, and, and the progression of cardiac allograft vasculopathy was assessed by IVUS. There was less rejection in serolimus groups, and there was less progression of cardiac allograft vasculopathy in the serolimus groups in green versus azathioprine in red. One thing that was observed is that there was an increased creatinine in the patients getting serolimus, so it appears that there's an interaction between serolimus and calcineurin inhibitors. The rest of the world did the RAD study or the Everolimus study, um, and there was a reduction in this composite endpoint in the two patients receiving one of two doses of Everolimus versus azathioprine. Less, and this was due to a reduction in grade 3A or greater acute rejection from Everolimus, so a reduced rejection and it, but that wasn't a really interesting thing. The really interesting, in, interesting thing was the effect on cardiac allograft vasculopathy. So we had an IVUS substudy, and here's the catheter and uh, intimal hyperplasia. There was less of a change in maximal intimal thickness in the Everolimus groups versus azathioprine, and in a variety of other volumetric assessments by IVUS, also less progression in patients getting Everolimus. We defined the incidence of um, cardiac allograft vasculopathy by a change in maximal intimal thickness of 0.5 millimeters. This is 0.7. This would be a patient who has cardiac allograft vasculopathy. The incidence was less in the two Everolimus groups versus the azathioprine group. Um, but azathioprine subsequently disappeared as MMF replaced it, and so it, it was important for us to compare Everolimus to MMF. In addition, we also observed this elevation in creatinine. So we organized a study that would look at patients getting everolimus and having lower trough cyclosporin levels uh, than what we usually use with MMF. And we, we compared it to MMF. And we had an IVA substudy. And this was done uh, around the world. I'm sorry we didn't do it in South Korea, but uh, next time we will. These are the three arms. These are the two everolimus arms. So you can see a dramatic drop in cyclosporin trough, target troughs, MMF. These are the standard trough levels. There was no difference in rejection rates um, and no difference in any other uh, elements of the composite endpoint. And patients, in the, patients had a higher risk of death from infection in the Everolimus group 
if they got uh, other immunosuppression like uh, ATG, thymoglobulin. So what it basically means, the more immunosuppression you get, the higher the risk of death from, uh, from infection. And there were groups of patients that were at high risk of death, patients with low GFRs at baseline, patients who had ventricular assist devices pre-transplant that were infected were more likely to die. But concerns about wound dehiscence and mediastinitis were not seen. There was an increase in pericardial effusions. And we had an IVIS substudy, which showed a dramatic reduction in the instance of cardiac allograft vasculopathy versus MMF, much less progression of cardiac allograft vasculopathy, looking at change in maximum intimal thickness, and all the other volumetric measures. Again, Everolimus was much more successful at inhibiting progression. And, and even in groups that were at higher risk of developing cardiac allograft vasculopathy, patients with donor disease, diabetes, were le less likely to develop if they developed Everol if they got everolimus. But one thing that was clear was that using the mTOR inhibitors early in the post-transplant period is, is difficult. There's issues with renal insufficiency. So there have been a number of efforts to develop strategies to get around this. This is from Scandinavia, the schedule study, where they, at week 7 to 11, weaned patients off cyclosporin, switched them to everolimus, and compared them to a group that got the traditional cyclosporin-based, MMF-based regimen. And what they found was that there was less CMV infection in the everolimus patients, uh, better renal function in the everolimus patients who were now off cyclosporin. There were more rejections in the patients who were off cyclosporin, and there was but no hemodynamic compromise or death from, ever, from rejections. And there was a small group of patients who needed to be put back on low-dose cyclosporin because they had several episodes of rejection. In terms of cardiac allograft vasculopathy, they used IVIS as well. Less of a change in maximum intimal thickness and less of a change in volumetric measures. And the lower incidence of, of cardiac allograft vasculopathy in Everolimus group compared to the uh, controls. So you can actually get people off cyclosporin at three to four months post-transplant, avoid the renal insufficiency, have the beneficial effects on cardiac allograft vasculopathy uh, using Everolimus, the mTOR inhibitor. There have been other studies looking at uh, switching to Everolimus. This is the Everhart study from Italy. And their goal was just to switch people from, from MMF Deverolimus plus cyclosporin and steroids and show that it was safe. And they did, in fact, show that it was safe with no renal dysfunction. The one thing they, too, saw was an increase in pericardial effusions, but no difference in rejections and no difference in wound healing. And they made the switch from one to three months. And they're very long-winded. Now, one of the most exciting studies was about a year and a half ago, published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology from the Mayo Clinic, where they, at one year post-transplant, switched patients off cyclosporin to serolimus. And then they looked at changes in cardiac allograft vasculopathy defined by IVIS. So they were well beyond the period where there's issues with wound healing or pericardial effusions or renal insufficiency. And what they found was if you make the switch at one year, you have less progression of cardiac allograft vasculopathy in orange compared to patients who stayed on cyclosporin. That's shown here, too, and here as well. And the most significant thing is you had, they had better outcomes, less cardiac death, less cardiac events, less CAV-related events. So you can actually, at one year, by switching to uh, the mTOR inhibitors, improve outcomes. And that's a very significant finding. And here's composite of CAV events or death. Um, this is early serolimus, late serolimus, and cyclosporin. If you make the switch at two years, beyond one year, the outcomes aren't as good. So when mTOR inhibitors, when started later after transplant, can attenuate the development of cardiac allograft vasculopathy 
favorably, favorably influencing major adverse cardiac events and death. And these can be done to mitigate the issues of renal dysfunction and wound healing seen in, when the agents are used early after transplant. But not everything works on cardiac allograft vasculopathy. Rituximab is an anti-CD20 uh, monoclonal antibody that inhibits T cell function. We sometimes use it to treat patients who were sensitized to prevent antibody production. And there was a National Institutes of Health randomized study looking at um, rituximab versus placebo in the early post-transplant period. And IVUS was used to look at progression, cardiac allograft vasculopathy. And you could see that placebo, there was less progression than rituximab. So we're not as smart as we think we are. Now, what do we do about patients who already have cardiac allograft vasculopathy? Well, we don't know that much at this point. Um, this is a study from Columbia University in New York where they took patients with established cardiac allograft vasculopathy. They randomized them to stay on standard therapy or to um, be switched to sirolimus. What they found using something called the catheterization scores was there was less progression with sirolimus. And then the composite of catheterization scores, death, acute MI, or need for vascularization, there was greater freedom in the sirolimus than in the control group. This is a Spanish study, Everostat, where they randomized patients to, um, to get uh, Everolimus. They decreased cyclosporin, got them off MMF versus standard therapy. They did IVUS. The study was too small to identify any clinical differences, but when they looked at IVUS, there was less progression of cardiac allograft vasculopathy in the Everolimus group than the standard group. We see that here, too. So that's cardiac allograft vasculopathy, and I think using the mTORs later can favorably affect this. What about malignancy, the other cause of death? Um, so this, again, we've seen this slide. Malignancy increases over time in transplant re recipients. This is from the national database in the United States, SRTR, looking at renal transplant patients, finding that a lower patients who either are on mTOR inhibitors or mTOR inhibitors plus calcineurin inhibitors had a lower rate of re developing re uh, malignancy than patients who are on calcineurin inhibitors alone. And what we're seeing with some of the greater use of calcineurin, in, of, of mTOR inhibitors and greater screening of patients for malignancies, we're seeing greater freedom from malignancy. Once patients, of course, are diagnosed with malignancy, the outcomes are worse, and we've seen this slide too. Now, why might mTOR inhibitors work in these patients? It turns out mTOR is a critical protein in the proliferation of malignancy, of, of malignant cells. And mTOR inhibitors in the U.S. are approved as adjunct therapy in renal cell carcinoma, in breast cancer, and a number of other cancers. This is the Bolero study where patients uh, with metastatic breast cancer were randomized to very high-dose ev everolimus versus placebo, and there was less progression of disease. So the mTOR inhibitors, also called the proliferation signal inhibitors, reduce the rates of CMV infections, reduce the incidence and severity of cardiac allograft vasculopathy, uh, can result in significant reduction of calcineurin doses and target trough levels. And we often will use these drugs to eliminate calcineurin inhibitors in patients with elevated creatinines. They may reduce the incidence of malignancy. We have to have more data about that. They can adversely affect wound healing, and when used early in the post-transplant period, can potentiate nephrotoxicity of CNIs. There may be an increase in bacterial infections, but not, not an increase in death unless you use concomitant thymoglobulin and the increased serum triglycerides.